Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to an episode of The Art Tenders with Mac and Dan. I am Dan, he is Mac. Hello! So, for past few months, we've been reviewing and discussing and really taking a magnifying glass into the show titled The Wire, a show that was created by David Simon and Ed Burns and chronicled life in Baltimore and, and looking at different systems and how they operate with one another in Baltimore. But before they made The Wire on HBO Mac, they made a miniseries on HBO in 2000, oh, in the year 2000. Okay. Called... I took a trip to the year 2000. Okay. Called The Corner. Mm. This was a, like I said, a miniseries. And instead, this one was actually based off of a book that David Simon and Ed Burns wrote together, titled The Corner, A Year in the Life of an Inner City Neighborhood, which was written in 1997, and was actually based on a true story. It kind of took place over a year that David and Ed spent in this one area of West Baltimore. Now, this is an adaption of that book, and therefore also an adaption of a true story of actual people's lives. Here we have the miniseries and by extension the book mostly following the story of the McCullough family which is Gary, Fran Boyd, and DeAndre McCullough and their sort of experience right there are still other people that are involved but there's a big heavy focus on those three individuals so Mac I want to ask you this because also let's let's also consider the fact that this was the baby this crawled before the wire could run but even after watching the wire and now watching the corner mac at least at the very least what were your first impressions of the corner uh it made total sense that it was the precursor to the wire i mean it you can really really tell um not only that uh the way they shot it and obviously the fact that it's in baltimore but um Everything about it was very reminiscent of season one of The Wire, um, right. where they took more of a look at uh, the actual neighborhoods rather than like the, the, the systems or the police or the education. So um, much of the first season of The Wire took place on those corners. Yeah, on the exact same streets that they did the corner. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and it's, it's really clear. Uh, and I do... Um, understand that they are similar to other but but the big thing is that uh this is so very obviously um a precursor to the wire yeah and that it is um it definitely walked so that the wire could run in that it's not as high quality no. um and not just in production because the production actually didn't really bother me it was more like in the way that it was formatted in the way that it was written um it was very theatrical the very first thing that i thought whenever i watched it was this feels more like theater than it does like mm -hmm. film mm -hmm. um it felt super august wilson-y in the way that they uh handled um dialogue and the way that they handled uh like 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 text and um actual you know uh, uh dialect usage in the writing right um and then also was very theatrical in that it felt very monologue -y. like pretty much every single episode had very monstrously long monologues mm -hmm. where it would just be a person talking and it would be one thing if it was like real time but it felt like it was directed like it wasn't um there wasn't a lot of silence like they had in the wire. I mean, there was yeah. silence, but there wasn't a lot of silence within the monologues. Right. Um, and so it made it feel very theatrical because that's that that's the biggest difference between how people really are and um, how you see them in a theater setting or in a very directed setting is is the way that uh, their relationship with time. Now, I do want to mention that I do feel that this show dips its feet a lot more into the subtext. In between yeah. lines, I would say more so than The Wire, right? Because I think fundamentally of like who these characters slash people are, that they're trying to be so much more than the life that surrounds them all the time. And I think that's perfectly exhibited in the text. And even when it's like some more obvious lines. So when you have something like uh, DeAndre telling his mother that I'm going to be a father to my son. Right? Like, that's such an obvious subtext of how 
absent his own father was, right? Yeah. And so it's very, very obvious, obvious in that sense, but because all of these people are sort of like battling their demons, they're always saying something underneath. Like yeah. nobody is inherently face value in this show. And we see people who are broken. I don't think there's a single character, single person in this piece that isn't broken. Yeah. And I think what that leads to textually, of course, is that you're going to get uh, I mean, it's it's also really weird because we're, we're speaking on this interpretation of a book, which was a writing down and journalistic sort of approach to this one area, right? And so it's kind of like, it, it does feel weird, like, talking about the presentation and, like, the storytelling of this show, but then it's also just based on a true story. And I don't really get the sense in this story that really much or maybe any of it at all was made up yeah and there was something very human yeah. about everything and and it was something that was uh consistent as well in the wire that everything felt so incredibly authentic and that came through in the writing right but not only did this authenticity come through in the writing on the corner but there was also this constant desperation and this constant just shit happening i don't know how else to articulate it but this constant shit happening that couldn't be written into yeah you know into a script right right and and there was also something about the um the way that i mean because it was monologue and, be, and because it was like interview ish yeah it felt like it was pretty much taken directly from a person yeah. um it felt like it was uh, David Simon and Ed Burns sitting down with people and um, asking them about their story and them taking a lot of whatever it was in that conversation putting it straight into the show. Like They didn't twist it into like some convoluted story. They, they had uh, a lot less scenes and a lot less um, plot points. Um, and I think that that was because they were trying their hardest to honor the original stories. The I think so. Stories. I think so too. That was and, the vibe I got. And but but that was also reflected. And one thing that I actually really enjoyed by the show, and at first I was like turned off by it, but towards the end I was like, this is just a very interesting and neat touch. Where you have the actual director Charles S. Dutton, who yeah. directed every single episode. What would happen at the beginning and the end of episodes is that he would interview a character. Now, he wouldn't interview the actual, like, people that were um, being expressed in the show, but we'll get to that in a moment. But, um, so, for example, in the very first episode, at the very beginning, he's interviewing uh, T.K. Carter's Gary, right? And then later on, he's interviewing Candy Alexander's Fran, et cetera, et cetera. And so it actually provides a much more of a journalistic slash documentary approach, right? And I think it plays into the honoring of the original quote-unquote source material where you have them wanting to tell this story and tell this story through a screen but also kind of approach this story with this honesty that documentaries provide and i actually found them to be very very clever with that approach of having this sort of fake but not really fake because i'm sure some of that uh text was from the book, and that text is probably from the actual people um, that they're, that are being interviewed, quote-unquote. So I found it to be really enriching towards yeah. the end because it was like we were we were getting even closer to these people's lives. Right. It, it felt like they wanted to make a documentary at first, but that they realized that that was kind of a shitty thing to do to these people in their lives and also like impossible right and they right. already made their own version of a documentary by writing the book in right. 1997 and then a few years later making the miniseries and so it was kind of like their yeah their step into a documentary world of still wanting to retell the story but yeah like i said provide that honesty now what was interesting about this viewing experience was I only found out sort of halfway through that this was actually based on a true story. Now, you might be asking, Danny, how did you not know when every episode starts with based on true stories? Yeah. Because I thought there's a lot 
of that sort of idea that happens in uh, media, yeah. particularly TV shows and movies where these are stories, but they're influenced yeah. by real stories, by real people. And that's very loose nowadays. Exactly. So yeah. when it, when something is based on a true story, that could mean anything. And right. for all we know, for example, the movie Fargo yeah. by the Coen brothers is said at the beginning based on a true story when that's purely there to throw you off and make you think that's based on a true story when it isn't. Or when you have Pain and Gain by Michael Bay, and which takes a tremendous amount of creative liberties with its, you know, with its art per se. Yeah. But you have this where I actually didn't know that it was based on a true story, but I think, at least in my experience, Mac, if you could speak to this a little bit, I actually felt that it enhanced the viewing experience because it was, I mean, it was very much so we were looking at a lot more of like these people's lives. The the fact that it was based on a true story, you mean? Yeah. Yes, I, I totally agree. Um, I... Uh, I, I, I did all of a sudden feel this inherent connection to characters a lot more whenever I really settled into the fact that it was based on a tr based on true stories. Yeah. Um, it took me to like maybe the second because the first episode I was kind of just like getting my bearings. Like I didn't fully process that this was real things that happened to real people. Yeah. Um, until the second episode, and that's whenever I was like, oh man, like this is. This is heavy. This is really a lot heavier. And I think that's something that we can also say that it um, that makes it much different from The Wire is that, funny enough, even though The Wire is like one of the most hard-hitting dramas on television, yeah. it is. it does not hold a candle to the seriousness and the uh, blunt nature of The Corner. Um, the Wire does have a lot more like relaxed moments, and it is a lot more not not dramatic, like dramatic in a story way, not dramatic in a genre way. Yeah. Um. And it, and and so it like has these huge like th these buildups and everything, and it gets your heart racing. But it's not like like in the corner. There were very few times where I was like excited or like getting revved up. I mainly just I w I would find myself just like staring at the screen with a blank face and just like like lulling into a depression not in a no no, no i listen uninterested way listen i had that experience too yeah like this is a sort of like gut wrencher is a bit strong of a word but this is a lulling depression of a show it is yeah but i think it's to the show's betterment right and yeah. so so let's go back a little bit to the wire <laughs> never and... given that review for anything <laughs> it's for the show's betterment that it's a lulling depression going back to the wire that so much of the text in the wire the lines that are spoken are so rich i mean a lot of it is like poetry right and so uh and i mean even though the lines are fantastic I don't think you're ever removed from the fact that, oh, these are lines written on a page, you know? Like, it's, I mean, don't get me wrong, I think The Wire is still so exceptionally written, and hardly anything holds a candle to that show, period. Yeah. But there was something about the text in this show, there's no exciting text in this show. Now, there are, like you said, a few monologues, but there's, they're not like crazy monologues or anything like that like you i mean you have like a simple line in the wire where carver and herc are having a conversation and um carver says oh this can't be a war and then herc says why not and then carver says because wars end and this that sort of like insightfulness that every single character has that makes yeah. all of the lines super duper yeah. interesting that, that everyone even though they're not fully aware is at least aware to a point. And, and the creativity. And there's so much creativity in lines. Right. When you have, um, like, Sergeant Rawls saying something along the lines of, you're a bleep hair away from indictment, so you dare. Yeah, right. Like, so, something, like, super creative like that. Who says that? I don't know. And there, I mean, I can imagine also that this text, per se, was ripped from actual people. But there was the text in the corner was so much more believable because of how grounded and how uninteresting it was, mm -hmm. that it really sold the fact even more so that these are people going through shit. And then doubly so with how this miniseries was shot. That's the best way I could describe it is this sort of guerrilla 
uh Yet. not gorilla but gorilla like gorilla warfare where uh constantly the camera is never on a stand it's always on somebody's shoulder and always yeah. walking with them and it's just it's not necessarily hectic yeah it's not shaky cam but it's very clearly being held. Yes, and it has that documentary sense it is, yes. of, like, nothing is necessarily clean, and we're kind of just up in everybody's business, but nobody's acknowledging the camera, though. You just happen to have this, like, insight of this particular yeah, moment yeah. that you're getting right now, which... I mean, it just makes this show a much more enriching experience. Now, I'm not going to, like, sit here and be like, this is the best thing I've ever seen on television because it because it isn't, yeah. you know? And and this isn't because, like, the show is written poorly because the show is based on real people's lives and real people's events that so much of the show, as we mentioned, is this lulling depression. Like, it's hard to get through episodes sometimes. Yeah. Like, you'll finish an episode and you'll say to yourself, I don't want to watch another. Yeah. And not because the show is bad, but because, like, how awful it is to watch these people go through these experiences. Right. When you have Gary... He's not a binger. No. Yeah. And when you have Gary McCullough constantly have the realization of, I'm a drug addict. I used to have money. I used to have a family. I used to have a life. Yeah. Now I'm just a dope fiend on the streets, uh, stealing steel from a yeah. junkyard and and scraping, scraping just to get another piece of blow. Yeah. And watching him have that constant realization and then watching him constantly just keep going back to drugs right. is really heart-wrenching to see. And so much of it is almost all of these characters in this show doesn't really have a support system. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's really well said when, like, it's not necessarily, like, the war on drugs. It's not necessarily on the drugs or on the kids selling these drugs. But it's what happens is that the kids like DeAndre, you know, in real life and in this story, gets hurt when... There isn't a place in society for them. The place in society for them is the corner. Mm -hmm. And that and that was something that the real person, DeAndre McCullough, like constantly tried to avoid and and had so much trouble to till the day he died. Yeah. That he it was very, very difficult for him to get out of that corner life. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the funny thing um, about the fact that it's all true story and, and that it's, it's these people's actual stories is that um, they, uh, the format is, it feels specific and it feels important, um, but I actually had a lot of problems with the format of the show okay. about the fact that it was documentary-ish and interview-ish um, and that it... Uh, was very theatrical and monologue-y, and um, whenever it was a scene, it was sh short-lived and quick. Um, th there were a lot of issues that I that I had with that. Um, and the funny thing is, is that I think that David Simon and Ed Burns had issues with it too, because every issue that I can think of that I had with the corner was immediately solved in the wire. How could you articulate on that Absolutely. fact a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, the the like the specific issues. Yeah. yeah. Um, like for instance, I I really think that it is uh, ineffective for me to um, be getting information about a person by them just straight up telling me the information rather than showing me the information. Okay. The whole like show me, don't tell me um, is uh, very present in the wire, not at all really in the corner. They they'll just tell you. Um, and uh, it's yeah, it's it's not as like nuanced. Um, What's a specific example to that? Um, I mean, like, like for instance, uh, I I think in some of the first moments of the show, uh, he's interviewing uh, Gary. Yeah, and he's talking to him, and instead of like us just seeing Gary go and because in a couple seconds he's gonna go and do heroin, we're about to watch it. Um, but instead of just showing us, they have to say. So when was the last time you did heroin? And it's like, okay, well, 
you don't mm, let's just yeah. let's just go to the heroin. Let's yeah. you don't have to show you don't have to tell me that. Yeah. Um and it was kind of interesting watching him like watching the actor try and use the given circumstances to like deepen the character, but whenever you just tell me all the given circumstances, it doesn't look deep, it looks surface level. Yeah. It looks like it's just there. And as opposed to like a physical exploration of like what does it look like for a person to like that 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 loves heroin and that is addicted to heroin to yeah. know that he's about to go into heroin right now and that even though the show 110% explores that yeah. and explores a lot of so much of it is yeah. you Gary just... just trying to get heroin <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. What That's happened? A very funny realization. I don't know. What happened? Like, it's just funny the way that you said that. Yeah, like it's. It, I don't know. It was. It was just funny. Like the realization. So much of the show is just Gary trying to get heroin. But the, I mean, but that's, right. a, but that's the is. devastating part it about absolutely it. Is. It's so sad that it never stops him. Yes, and that Blue, one of the characters and one of the people at the like one of the final moments of the show. Uh, says along the lines of like the hardest worker in America is a dope fiend, is a drug addict. Yeah. Drug addict. Yeah. Like there is no job more difficult because you wake up with only ten cents to your name and you will do anything, whatever it takes, just to get a little yeah. bit of something. That get, to get that twenty bucks. And so we, yeah. but for a lot of the show, like we see that right. And so when Blue says that our minds automatically go back to our experience with Gary throughout the entirety of the show where we constantly see him do this and that and this and that just to get high yeah. here and there. And it's also heart-wrenching too because occasionally we'll get flashbacks. Yeah. Kind of, um, I think, pretty well done here too where the flashbacks just sort of appear and it's not necessarily flashbacks just for storytelling sakes but it's you kind of see the character go through the memory experience and having the flashback uh -huh. is how these flashbacks are incorporated we but we see a plenty of flashbacks of gary going back and being with his family and having a life and so then in contrast to what he's doing now like it it really puts you through the ringer of this show yeah. and it makes it even more detrimental like to your heart when you're reminded, oh my God, this is a real person. Right, like, right. Like an actual person did these things. You know, there's yeah. something very different about like watching procedural television and watching those characters do X, Y, and Z. But there was something very different about not necessarily just... Because a documentary would have just told us the things that Gary did, yeah. right? But instead... And it kind of wanted to, yes. but it didn't totally. But instead with this, where we have a sort of reenactment, right? Yeah. Of the events where we see, per se, Gary go through yes. the experience, yes, you know? Yes, yes. And I think that's what made the story to the corner a lot more powerful was because we saw those people go through those experiences. That mm. we weren't just told about those experiences, right? Like, I can sit here all day and tell you about, I don't know, the intricacies and the life of a stick-up boy in Baltimore, right? And I could tell you all these things. And it could be fascinating information, right? But there's something different about you watching, and it feels like a very accurate reenactment, of those events and so then you can get a better sense of what was actually going on in that moment because not only are you being told of the events but you're also seeing and and hearing and feeling what is going on uh -huh. in those moments yeah and so you when you have that moment of the junkyard owner chasing down gary and that little posse with the truck and the junk that they've stolen and you have like gary realizing oh my god this isn't for me and like the next scene later it's just like i almost like even though i didn't get hurt maybe i could have died there yeah. and so there's something very very different about that when it is in comparison to just being merely told that information yeah. and so i do i honestly like I guess in the, in the fact of this statement that I really do want to give credit to this show, I guess on the basis of just existing and <laughs> of, but like, but telling this story. Yeah. And yeah, sure, sure. I think it becomes really, really powerful, particularly, and I'll bring this up now at the very 
end of the show, the very last moments where you have Charles S. Dutton, the director, yeah, narrating. actually narrating and actually interviewing Fran Boyd mm -hmm. and Blue and Tyreka and DeAndre. And Ty Tyreka is the mother to DeAndre's son. And, like, actually interviewing them. And th there was something, I don't know how to articulate it. But I will, uh, uh, wow, English is hard sometimes, but I will articulate it by saying, like, I actually cried. Yeah. During, there was this weird sense of relief about yeah. it where, like, this corner did not necessarily define these people's lives. But then it was also so tremendously tough for them that um, there was a former NBA player named John Amici. And uh, around last year or so, he said, and I think he articulated this fantastically, where uh, privilege is the lack of impediment. That if, for example, if you have legs, you have the privilege to walk on stairs mm. as opposed to somebody in a wheelchair, right? And so for us to Mac, we have the privilege of not having to go through that experience of the corner. And so, but... That doesn't prevent us necessarily from viewing this experience and, and sympathizing with these people. And so to see, you know, if Fran in that interview at the very end, she was four years clean at that moment. And to just like hear that is so nice mm -hmm. because I think the show did a very good job of giving us an inside view into Fran Boyd's life, for example. Of giving us an inside view into what happens with these people. And I think that's what really aided this show overall. That even though this was a kick in your butt every single episode. And it was hard to get through episodes occasionally because of how depressing it was. Because it's these people. It's these people just milling around in their own shit. And mm -hmm. you want to like hold up a mirror to them and have them realize you can do better. But it's not as simple as that. Yeah. And it's very simple for us to say it because we have that privilege. Do you think that uh, the that 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 quote that rattled around in your mind or that feeling of privilege is what led you to that emotional response? I I mean, I think so, right? Because like Like was was that what you were thinking as you were watching it? It was like It was uh, partially the realization of just it's it's hard to really count the blessings. Because yeah. there are so many of them uh, in regards to us, right? Mm. Um, but I, I think, and I think the real Fran Boyd says it really well at the end that she really hopes that this show can at least be something for others where it, it not necessarily be a sort of like warning sign, but it is showing the trials and tribulations that these people go through and the like. Does it take a lot of work to get out of those situations? Absolutely. And, and I think I think so much of it was just me being happy for them in that moment, right? Yeah. And so it did feel like we got like a really close view of their lives. And so to see them come out on the other side better feels relieving, right? Because yeah. I, I've, if we were ignorant on the subject, if we were, and we're still relatively ignorant on the subject, but if we were tremendously more ignorant on the subject, we would say, oh, just stop doing it. Right. Just go get some help. But it's not that simple at all. Yeah. It's not that simple by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. And so when we see how difficult it is, and then when we do see them achieve, even if it's just a couple of them, when it really, it literally is just a couple of them get through it. Like that's that. I mean, it's, it's this sort of like emotional stress that you gain. That's finally released. And like, you're able to like, know that like, that they're okay. Right. Not saying that we could have done much in this particular space, uh -huh. but, but it's, it's that sense of relief. And, and which is exciting because that's something that the wire definitely never did. Yeah. Because we keep, I mean, 
And rightfully so, I think we keep comparing this to The Wire. I mean, same people, same writers. We are yeah. only watching so it much of the, of the same actors. So much of the same actors, which which we'll get to, if, I'm sure. Um, very very similar experiences, and we have come hot off the heels of The Wire. But that's one thing that it really had over The Wire is that even though I did I definitely have emotional experiences in The Wire, I definitely never truly felt the um, the perspective that the corner gave me um and i really uh, and i think that you can agree with that yeah i i really uh never felt um the sense of distance f between me and baltimore yeah and me and the corner mm -hmm. um whereas in the wire i was like man that's crazy like i've i've seen some crazy stuff too this i was like i i'm so far away from this yeah, I'm like I'm so that I, I I cannot relate to this at all, and that makes me feel shitty. But it I mean it, it is it is what it is. Let's hear a word from our sponsors. All right, if you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Now, just let me explain. First of all, it's free. Second of all, Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and a whole bunch more. And third, now this is really important, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Hear me when I say no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Mac and I were discussing in the break how, like, admittedly, like, this is a difficult show to review. Not because of the, like content in it it has nothing to do with that per se but it's necessarily like this i mean this show is that depression lull right yeah. it's that sort of like feeling that you get around your heart the entire time and like i said in the previous segment that it's it's these people milling through this shit and these people trying to find ways and it's people falling back into their own demons right it's it's deandre for example like once again trying to find a job he can't find a job so he's back on the streets okay now he's done with the streets he's going back to a job okay that job he's upset with the manager so he leaves the job he's back on the streets etc 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 and and so like a lot of the show to, show is that right and i think it's it's also similar to the wire in that sense where the wire every single season every single season at the end of the season it's this sort of repeat of the cycle that everything kind of goes back to where it was at the beginning of the season you know as if nothing happened but all these people's lives are changed at the yeah, same time yeah. where in the corner you still have that presence of the cycle but instead, the cycle is just these people's demons and what they go through. And so Gary's cycle is doing dope, realizing that he used to be more than that, and going back to doing dope. Mm -hmm. And then it's Fran, for example, like doing that sort of similar thing, but then getting off of dope and being detoxed and then going back to it. And then DeAndre's is what I just stated, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so... A lot of the, per se, storytelling in the show is repeated, and there's not, like, anything David Simon or Ed Burns or David Mills could have done about that. Yeah. Because these are just real people. And so it's, once again, it's weird to look at the show and be like, man, I, I wish the writing would have done this, but, like, the writing couldn't have been anything but that. Yeah. Because then it just would have been dishonest. I just realized something. What do you think David Mills did to not get invited on the wire? I don't know. What, I, this we can't have room. <laughs> I'm sorry. Stop it. Rumor, rumor. Well, talk. no, we just can't. We don't have the room, the space, the I etiquette, know, the, but I, it just the credentials my mind. It to speculate. In my mind. Okay. It Shoot an email then. To David or Mills or no, to any of the Davids. <laughs> hey. Saint David, I don't care. <laughs> no, 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 no. David okay. Freeze, I don't care. It I'm doesn't matter. Freeze? David Freeze of the Cardinals, the St. Louis oh, Cardinals. God, well, okay. formerly of the St. Louis Cardinals. Wrong I don't know. For me. I apologize. Anyways. So, um, I, well, I, I also wanted to ask you something. Do yes. you think that you would have liked this show as much if you hadn't watched The Wire before? Yeah, tough, right? Do you I, 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 think, I think this show... As a viewing experience, it the show is better after The Wire. Yeah, definitely. Because even though The Wire is a better show and is a better shot show and a better acted show and a better directed show, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that 
this is a better piece to view afterwards because of how much more honest yeah. it is that i think i think what the wire does really well is it paints this beautiful honest picture of baltimore as a city right yeah. and all the systems that are involved in it and these very big broad strokes where i mean comparatively to other shows those those strokes are tiny but broad strokes right to really represent okay the police department okay the dope fiends on the corner okay the uh the drug lords okay the the guys who sell on the corner okay the journalism department the working class etc the government office right where you have a lot more specific of strokes in this show where it's just the corner and it's just this group of people and so you get this really really intimate look right where the wire touches the subject but it doesn't completely commit itself to the subject because it can't and mm -hmm. doesn't have the time to mm -hmm. and so even though the pacing of the wire is absolutely impeccable and unlike anything i've ever seen if it would have done what the corner did it would have just sank its feet into the mud and not yeah. really gotten anywhere. Yeah, and, and, and it, it was very clear after watching the show that The Wire was about Baltimore, whereas The Corner was about the people of Baltimore. Yeah. And, and, and that's awesome. That was, really, that was really awesome to have. But because, like we were talking about, it does lull and it does sit for, for a while in, these, in the feels or whatever. It's, it's not like an action-forward piece necessarily. Yeah. Um, the... The problem uh, with that is that it takes a lot of trust. It takes a lot of trust from me as an audience member to be like, okay, I know where this this is going to get somewhere important. And if I hadn't watched The Wire beforehand and trusted David Simon and Ed Burns infinitely already, I don't think that I would have enjoyed it nearly as much. Now, with that being said, though, like I can also see why HBO executives absolutely trusted David Simon and Ed Burns after this show, right? Because of how yeah. it approached television funny you say that because as the entire first segment i kept thinking to myself because we keep talking about how this ended up as the wire and it's actually funny to think about like how they got the next gig because it wasn't like oh and then this magical thing all of a sudden appeared it makes total sense yeah that they start at the uh that the, they're journalists or and they know each other through the journalism route and then they use those pieces of journalism to get the means to write their book and publish it with and, and and they get their ethos that way and then through the book they use that to pitch this show and then make this show and through this show they use this show to pitch this show and make the wire and then after the wire and and so on and so forth that they just keep making these larger and larger projects and it's very clear the line that they took from one thing to the next and how it's like, okay, what we want to do is kind of like what we did last time, but a little better because it's about this now. And then they just keep making it bigger and bigger and bigger. And now we have new projects coming up like we talked about with George Pelicanos. Yeah. And it's it's also so much of it too is like, okay, we're going to write what we know. Yeah. That David Simon right, and Ed right. Burns spent a year with this community, right? Right. Okay, we're going to write what we know. It's literally that. And then the next step of that is like, okay, so we're going to adapt some of the corner stuff and also some of the police department stuff, which Ed Burns was a police detective. Okay, we're going to do some of that. All right, now we're going to bring in a writer in Rafael Alvarez and we're going to bring in part of the working class and the stevedores on the docks. Yeah. And et cetera, et cetera. Like it's so much of it is a step-by-step -step process of like writing what you know and then going from there as a sort of writing creative process. And so kind of doing it in reverse, I think it's really enriching though to see what David Simon and Ed Burns did after uh after the corner. Now, but I can also I also agree with you that it's it's a bit tricky to trust this show in the middle of it because like like I said, you don't want to watch an another episode. Yeah. Because you can kind of feel that Fran is going to go back to her bullshit and yeah. and, and and the 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 CMB group as they're called mm -hmm. is uh, they're all going to go back to their bullshit. Right. Like it's it's really tough to like watch that, but it's also makes you realize that as an audience member and like as an american and as a citizen like we don't want to look at that right right and the it, show forces you to look at it no matter what and so it, it really like goes hard at your sensibilities of like we don't want to look at this because we don't want to believe that this is real this can't be happening to real people but it is it totally is. and it yeah. totally 
is probably, I mean, I don't know for a fact, but I am so certain it's still happening. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it must be still happening. The um, And that's, I mean, that's what the show and this and The Wire keeps telling us is that yeah. it's never going to stop. And it's um, and it's not sugarcoated either. Yeah. And there's nothing pretty about the show. There's nothing ugly about the show, but there's certainly nothing pretty about this show. Right. Well, um, funny enough, I actually, I, I watched it on YouTube yes. um, through, through that. And that's the issue with this is that for some reason, this was a miniseries on HBO and it's not accessible on HBO Max. You yeah. cannot find this on streaming services. It is, I think, illegally on YouTube, and that is the only means to watch this show yeah. unless you get a physical copy, and that's really frustrating. It is, because at the same time. Because I want to support this work. Yes, but at, at the same time, it is kind of baller, though, because every single time that I see something like that that's been on YouTube for a couple years and is still there, it's because the producers or or the, the, the lawyers attached to the show they they know it's there. Yeah, they They've have seen to, it, right? Yeah, they they do. They do know it's there because it's, it's hard not to figure it out. Yeah, like when you type in it, the corner on YouTube, it, it pops up. Yeah, and it has for years. So the thing that's so interesting to me, though, and that I kind of like about that is that that shows me that they don't give a shit about how much money it makes, and it has nothing to do with the monetary value of it. Yeah, they simply want people to see it. That's all it's about, which is cool. I, I do appreciate that. Yeah. But because I was watching it on YouTube, um, there were times whenever I would scroll through the comments, right? Just oh, yeah. to see what people said, or especially like during the credits and things like that. And um, it was funny because every single episode has a million comments where everyone just keeps saying, oh, this should have been six episodes. This is like like a million episodes too short. And like, man, this should have this should have gone on forever. And I, I, I just hate that it's six episodes. <laughs> but I'm, I totally disagree. Like, I think this is... Just as many as it needs. Yes. Like, why I think that any more, any less. Even taking would have been... even taking away the fact that this was a retelling of a book. Even just like let's just step away from that and let's just yeah. step away from the fact. Let's say that this, this was, was a original true story. piece. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Let's let's say this was something that, that they made and they decided to make it exactly six episodes long. It still is exactly where it needs to be. And it's for that reason that it's like it's it's tough. Mm -hmm. It's tough to get through. And that's not, like, we're saying that a lot. And that's not to the show's detriment. That's no. just how it is. And it is to the show's no. betterment because of how honest it is. And how much it forces you to look at these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's it's really, really tough. But I'm curious. You have a, a piece pulled up uh, on the computer. And I, and I want to know what that's about now. Okay. So, in the... In 2012... There, DeAndre McCullough, who actually, funnily enough, appeared in The Wire as Brother Mazone's assistant. Now, I want you to think back. Can you remember what he looked like? I don't think so. Ah, that's fine. But the point is, he if was in The Wire. If I saw a picture wire. of him, I, I would know that, like, I would probably be able to think of it, but not right now, no. I, I will pull it up probably later tonight. Whenever it said that, did you instantly go, oh, yeah, I remember that Well, guy. when, when, okay. When I read that it was Brother Mazone's assistant, I was like, oh my god, yeah, that is him. Because you do see DeAndre McCullough at the very end of the corner being interviewed by the director. And I'm like, oh, that is Brother Mazone's assistant. Cool. But with that being said, I think the story that the corner tries to tell rings so true with the life of DeAndre McCullough. And what was really fascinating to me was so how the story ends for deandre in the show is deandre is really high and the police raid a sort of stash house that he's in with his cousin right and that actually really really upset deandre and he expressed that with david simon saying that isn't the end of the story you don't know that the story ends that way and i think like that i think that really rings true about this show that these people's lives isn't this one thing that gary's life even though he died a dope fiend he wasn't just a dope fiend that even though fran's life so much of it was being a dope fiend that doesn't mean she was just a dope fiend right um and so i think deandre's entire life was also like really a testament of like how difficult it was to get off that corner because at the age of 35 in 2012, he died from a drug overdose. Oh. So. Oh, God. Yes. And, and like, in Baltimore, and then also having a police warrant of an armed robbery that he committed. And 
David Simon wrote a piece on his website, a eulogy on, you know, davidsimon.com on DeAndre and how wonderful of a kid he was, right? And he also recounted the fact of how, like, his mother said that when she saw, like, the footage of him committing the armed robbery, like, he looked so incredibly sad, right? And I just want to read the final piece that David Simon writes in this eulogy. Well then, amid all of the easy labels and stereotypes that will now certainly apply, let me offer only the following. I once had the privilege to know a boy named DeAndre McCullough, who at the age of 15 had led a life of considerable deprivation, but who nonetheless was the fine and fascinating measure of a human soul. Everything after, even the very book that we wrote about his world, today seems like useless and unimportant commentary. And so, so even though DeAndre's life was like, trapped he was also still so much more than that and i think that's what the corner really shows as a television show that it's like these human lives that are trapped and these human lives that can't like they can physically get out here and there but it is so difficult for them emotionally mentally spiritually for them to get out and like it needs a miracle for them to get out and i think like one beautiful miracle that did happen once again with another person that whose story was told on this show and it's connected in this fascinating way was that in 2007 fran boyd married someone and she married the person that in the wire the stick-up boy omar little was based on donnie andrews Fran Boyd and Donnie Andrews connected because of David and because of Ed. And since they connected, they fell in love with one another, one, uh, one, <clears throat> excuse me, one another, and became each other's rock. And so it's this like beautiful wow. story that wow. came from the corner and it came from the wire and it came from david's oh experience and ed's experience like with fran boyd and then ed burns's experience with donnie andrews and then them really like realizing to themselves like these people are just human souls and they exhibit so much life they are never just this one thing you know yeah i think it's like really funny that uh, a former drug lord was the deacon in the wire like but like yeah. it's it's one of those things that like human life is just so complicated that we think one person is just this one thing but we know that's not the case yeah and we know that and we say to ourselves of course that's not the case but we fail to really come to terms and and truly realize that is the case that like these are human souls that exhibit so much that have so much life and I think that's what the corner really shows and the corner doubly shows how difficult the corner is. It's not just the corner in Baltimore. It's a corner in any American city or any city in the world and how difficult it is to get out. But that's like the purpose of the story being told that Fran Boyd recounts at the end of the show that she hopes like with this story that people don't have to go through her experience too. Mm -hmm. That people don't have to go through DeAndre's experience. People don't uh, don't have to go through Blue's experience, Fat Kurt's experience, etc. Do you think that David Simon, j just based off of the uh, the piece that you just read, d did you get the vibe that he not was ashamed, but but didn't really believe in the corner as much as he once did? What do you mean? Like the show, the corner, like like that he he didn't believe in what the show was going for as much as he did when he was making it. No, I don't, I don't, I didn't get that sense at all. Okay. No, but I think it's just like, it's it's not necessarily because that that show is not going to change everybody's lives because it's right. just like, it's for some of these people their lives are already shattered. Uh huh. You, you right, know? right, right. And so like you can have all the pieces, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have the glue or the tape to put it all together. You yes, know. Sure. And and that I think. I mean, I'm, I'm speculating. I'm speculating. Yes, here. I mean, same here. Obviously, but like right? that, that may have been the, the case. But that, but that it's, but that's not. 
I don't think David Simon would ever recount the corner as like not success in terms of the human experience and trying to change human lives because like it still did, and it uh-huh. still it still did for Fran. Uh-huh. It still did for Tyreek. It still did for Blue, but you got to understand that how tough it is for these people's lives already, and like we we can't. For us, we cannot put into words how addicting drugs are because you and I are not addicted to drugs. So we don't we don't know what that life is. We don't know what that life is of as Blue accounts waking up in the morning with only ten cents to her name and going through the trials and tribulations just to get a little bit of high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 I think that I, I definitely believe that the show is very important and did its job. Yeah. But I, I'm 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 commenting specifically on. Uh, useless and unimportant commentary I thought was fascinating that he ended the piece with that well because it's just what that book is and what the show is it's just a a very small glimpse into DeAndre's life Mm -hmm. that if you look at the show or the book as only DeAndre's life then you then either the show did not reach you or you are I mean you're just completely missing the point Uh that this is just a glimpse into that this is just a window into that house you know that, like, and I th- I think it's maybe it's David acknowledging that that is the case, right? That his relationship with DeAndre afterwards, with the twenty years, twenty years afterwards, became such an enriching one for him too, and such a, a beautiful learning experience for him as well as a human. You know? Yeah. And so, like, when you read that book and when you see that show, that's not. Like, that's only a small piece of DeAndre, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, like, we, I mean, we can read through this eulogy and we can we can read through other articles describing DeAndre's life and we can go through interviews, right? But we have to always acknowledge that those are only the smallest of pieces. And so we'll never be able to fundamentally, truly understand really deep down what DeAndre was going through in his head. I mean, the fact that, like... Having it alone that he never really had a father in his life because his father was always a dope fiend and then his father OD'd during the the shooting and the the, the shooting of the um of the corner. Like he never had that experience that his experience so much that his friends are either in jail or dead or depressed or addicted to drugs, that so much of the people he knows and loves are gone. And so like, but we'll never be able to like really grab that and understand his experience, right? Like we can uh-huh. we can get a piece of that and we can sort of sympathize with that experience, but we can never truly understand that experience because the only person that will only ever understand it is DeAndre. Mm. And so I I think like with David Simon here is just so much of what he loved about DeAndre was not just from the book that he wrote about him. You know, yeah. it was the life that followed after and the relationship that they had afterwards. Mm-hmm. And I think it's like, but but what, you know, blossomed and what, or rather what gave root to that connection was them doing the corner. And at least like maybe, I mean, and this is speculation and, and either David Simon could agree or disagree, but maybe, like, DeAndre's life and, and life experience was prolonged because of the experience on the corner. Like, because... And when I say the corner, I mean the book slash the TV show. Like, because of that experience, like, DeAndre was able to live a fuller life but wasn't still able to fully get out, mm-hmm. you know? And that's not necessarily anybody's fault. It's just what the war on drugs can create with people that started in poverty Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and how much how difficult it is to change Mm -hmm. in that regard and so it's it's in that fashion and so now that we have like really delved into the actual you know the, the story and the content and whatnot um I am curious, how did you feel about uh, specific performances? Was there anyone that, that stood out to you or that you felt like deserves 
uh, a special gold medal. So a gold medal is, uh, just to remind you, if you don't know, that we usually give it to maybe an actor or a director or maybe even a moment in uh, what we review uh, in order to really articulate, hey, this was fantastic. We want to point that out. And my gold medal easily is going to go to Candy Alexander oh, and yeah. her performance as Fran Boyd. And I think like the big thing for me was, and it plays back into the theatrical take that you had where how Candy Alexander explored through Fran Boyd's body was unlike some of the work that I've seen, period. It was how she was so loose in her body um, and this constant movement that was being exhibited. She never felt like any of her action, right? Any action that she was performing or any of her performance was only in her head or only in her voice. It was throughout the entirety of her body and through her posture and through her eyes and through her eyebrows and through her cheekbones. It was through everything and that was so clear. It was just a magical performance to watch. And I think like if you are interested in watching a performance that is focused on the physicality, then I most certainly think that Candy Alexander's Fran Boyd is the one for you now mac do you have a specific gold medal that you would like to uh put attention to in this show absolutely um funny enough i actually uh am getting the other side of the coin um i think we have complimentary people um i'm gonna give my gold medal to clark peters um i thought that his fat kurt was awesome was absolutely brilliant and uh partially it was because i saw, we saw him as lester freeman and I was blown away that he was able to pull off the uh, fat Kurt, but also um, I, I might even go even more specific with my gold medal and saying that it was uh, the scene between fat Kurt and Fran in the final episode yeah. um, that e even though it was brief and even though they spoke very little, um, just like you said, the subtext and uh, the, the, the moments that they had there were some of the juiciest moments in Obviously, the entire series. Yeah. But um, but I that that was one of the only times where I really felt like the writing went from good to great, you know. Uh, yeah. So that that that's where I would put my gold medal if I was to put one one somewhere. I do want to mention like this entire show had fantastic performances all around, and it makes total, complete, and utter sense why David Simon and Ed Burns. Reuse, yeah. I mean, a good, I don't know, seven eighths of the actors on yeah. this show. Yeah, right. Like, you look at one person, you're like, they look vaguely familiar. Oh, okay, on you the were wire. the assistant. You were the right. assistant principal. Oh, okay, yeah, right. like it's just like small stuff like that where so many of these actors are constantly reused. But like, I mean, it's a testament to not only the casting uh, of this show and the casting of The Wire, but also, I mean, these actors too. Yep. And how, like, so many of them are playing, like, the opposite forms of themselves in The Wire. Yeah, so right. we have, uh, for example, Corey Parker Robinson, who plays RC in the corner, and is this high school kid that is always up to trouble, but then he plays Sindor in The Wire, where he's this cop that's uh, very headstrong, but a very confident, a uh, hardworking, diligent, good police, as they say. Good in, police in that show. Yeah. And so it's it's fun just to watch that, and then you'll have occasionally the Easter egg, like the real Jay Landsman, uh, just for like two seconds in this show. It's stuff like that, but I think it. It, it, it aids also this show because then you're actually also having the real people being, you know, these characters. So you have the real Jay Landsman that the character of Jay Landsman in The Wire was based from. And he actually appears in the show. That you have David Simon actually appear in the back of one scene. They you have, you know, maybe Ed Burns here and there. Like, it's, it's those little things that aids in the experience of this show and aids in the storytelling of this show because they didn't have to do that but mm -hmm. they chose to mm -hmm. and i think the show deserves all the credit for it now that we are coming to uh the 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 back end or on the day crescendo uh if you will of the uh, i won't you won't we're coming to a close you shall okay um uh of not not just this episode but of the 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 wire series and our delve deep delve into this world of david simon and ed burns it's material 
D- did I say? You said delve, deep delve. Delve. I, I mean, yes, I know it's deep dive, but delve also applies. Is delve a noun? You know what? You keep talking, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna research. It is this. a delve. Okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. Have at it. Have at it. Go ahead, kiddo. Um, I'm curious what uh, out of the wire, the corner, anything. What have you learned, and what will you be taking forward? Delve is a verb. Yes, it's a verb, but, but not it, a noun. But it it, can, it has no potential to be a noun. <sighs> I mean, ah, uh, whatever. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe like a deep reach, you know? I guess, but like a uh, but a reach. I don't know. This is a reach. What did you learn from the wire slash corner? I think it's just the the writing and execution of said writing in the corner and in the wire is truly unlike any other and is so unique to that experience and is so difficult to replicate in other pieces of media mm-hmm. that I'm not entirely sure how to take uh, anything from it. Yeah, it's not necessarily how to take anything from it, but I guess yes, how, how to, to take how to steal. How yeah, 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 yeah. And then it's just like how do you do that? You know, because there's so much at play and there's so much juggling that's being done in this in these pieces of uh, of TV series that it's it's hard to really say, "Oh my god, they did this," but it was like they did 20 things at once. How do you really pinpoint? Like you have to rewatch it multiple times to get the specifics of every single moment. Um, but I think it, it still speaks to the quality of The Wire and, by extension, The Corner. And even though The Corner, sure, it's a weaker show, but nobody... I mean, you watch The Wire, and of course you're going to expect The Corner, the precursor to The Wire, to be the weaker show. And But that's not a detriment to The Corner. It's just it's more of a, a praise to The Wire and how incredible that is. Now, with that being said... I think with how David Simon and Ed Burns, how they were able to translate life to the screen is just some of the best I've ever seen. And some of the most honest work I've ever seen. That it's truly putting a mirror up to society and saying, hey, this is how shit goes down. And I I think that a very vital part of that is that they are not uh, at their core – filmmakers yeah like that's that's actually a very important part of the puzzle i think that they actually saw it not just saw it but were around it and enveloped in it for so long it wasn't like they were researching from the outside they were in the shit with them um that 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 was that's a very important part of it and on that i think that the thing that i'm i'm the two things that i'm inspired to steal are i i definitely want to try more writing room situations where i'm writing with a group of people rather than just by myself and then the other big one is that I want to try a lot more research-based writing yeah. um, where I – rather than just diving into a story, I actually pick a topic or a section or a, like, like, like a person or something that I'm interested in and actually spend as much time as I can months researching it and actually understanding it before writing anything about it. Because that's something that they are clearly very good at because they're journalists, obviously, yeah. um, that – I, I would like to uh, adopt into my own practices. And, like, with that being said, too, like, we mentioned it in the review of the fifth season of The Wire, but how not interested David Simon and Ed Burns were in the dramatic, right? Yeah. They were not interested, per se, in making uh, this crazy things happening. No, they were just interested in telling an honest story. Yeah. And then the, the interesting second- parts will come. Then the second it gets to violence, they cut away. Exactly. And that's something that, that stayed true throughout everything we've ever seen. I mean, we, we have the simple fact of, like, in The Wire that in so many procedural television cop shows, we have cops constantly pulling out and doing shootouts, right? When in The Wire, not a single cop shoots a gun except for Presbyluski a couple of times when he accidentally, you know, fires a gun and when he accidentally kills an undercover officer. And so I think it just – so what they're so much more interested in is the honest storytelling. Yeah. And I think for a lot of writers, the trap is so easily to make a story interesting when sort of trusting your narrative and trusting your own story and trusting the characters and the people mm-hmm. – that people are going to get interested. Yeah, yeah. I th- because I they will get invested in the honesty. I think it's very important to note that it's not just about trusting the actors and the people working on the project, but the people that surround the project. Because with for them, that's like half the, half the secret recipe is that 
what what made the show so special is not necessarily the people that worked on it, but the people that were next to the people working on it. The people of Baltimore that just wandered on set and had a say, yeah. and the and the and, and the people that influenced all of the actors' performances and the writers. Like the writers, just we talked to a few of them that were that they would find inspiration just walking around town and talking to random motherfuckers. Like that's just how the show was started. So I'm also curious. Um. Well, first of all, would you recommend the corner? And yes. specifically, <laughs> how how would you recommend consuming it? I mean, I would recommend it. Uh, well, I watched it after the wire, so I have and no it idea. Seems like the best. And I have no idea what the experience is watching the corner first and watching the wire because, like, we already trusted David Simon and Ed Burns, so we were watching the corner with no hesitation. Mm -hmm. Um. And so I think on the front end, you have to understand with the corner, at least, that, like, it's it, this is a true story. This is real people. This is based off a book, and that book is, like, a journalistic experience, you know? So it's you have to understand, like, this story is not interested in the dramatic. Yeah. It's just interested in the story. Absolutely. And so I think that's the big thing if you're going to watch the corner first. But this show is still very much so enjoyable, even if you view the wire first just you know for its own reasons of course how about you i would agree um i, I definitely think this is an asterisk show um there is like like I, I wouldn't just dive into this at any given point like i would i i would prepare myself for it and and have to know a little bit of the content before i really was able to commit to it but it's still i mean worth the worth its weight in gold um yes so uh w with that being said um and with that I mean, lovely piece on, I mean, just the wire and, and, and the, the corner as a whole. It's been a long six episodes. And then <laughs> yeah. plus two that we've done with uh, writers from the wire. Right. And so, I mean, we, we've we done a lot. We have, and maybe we'll do more in the future. Who yes. knows? Very oh, no, no, no. I don't think we're ever going to get off this train. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and when I'm, I'm, there's definitely some exciting stuff that we that we have in the works that we'll you know we'll try and pitch once we get there. But uh, either way, um, next week I would like to uh, review something of actually a friend of ours. A friend of ours made an album uh, called Seasons of Limbo, and um, uh, his artist name is Bometheus. And so we are going to be watching, or not watching. Well, you did this, miss. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Stop it. Stop it right there because you made that mistake. Before, too, that we were going to discuss an album, and you said watching. I can't remember which album. Damn, I'm sorry. But you've made this mistake before. Yeah, it's just because I. It, it's just because we watch so much. Consume. Just use a different verb. I, well, I used consume, consume a few minutes and ago. You, and you used delve a few minutes ago, which you found out it was a noun also. Was I it's wrong? also a noun. Okay. But either way, we are going to listen to... Nice work. <laughs> His album, uh, Seasons of Limbo. Thank you for listening.